Kinyonga, and wherever I go in the country, people, they say, how do you say your name? And I say, it's very easy, because in English, there's no mm sound. In Africa, there's a lot of mm sound. So can you say mm? Can you say shama? Put them together. You got it. You will never forget that, is it? <laughs> Yes, we are missionaries to Tanzania, and my wife, Martha, she's back there. Can you wave or stand or whatever, Martha? There she is. Yeah, we are missionaries to Tanzania, East Africa. Um, I was born and raised there in Africa. I grew up speaking Swahili. In Tanzania, we speak Swahili. And all my life, I spoke Swahili until I came here in the States in 2005. I started speaking English a little bit, so I'm trying, amen. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we, we just went back to Tanzania about seven, seven years ago. Uh, we were back there and started the church, and the church is, uh, is doing well. And I just talked to my assistant pastor even yesterday when I was coming here, and they're doing, they're doing good. Yeah. So I will share more tonight as you come back tonight. You see the video presentation and the church we started, and if you have any other questions, I'll be able to answer them tonight. But this morning, if you can open your Bible in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 7. 2 Kings, chapter number 7. 2 Kings, chapter number 7. We'll look, uh, we'll look through uh, this book of 2 Kings, chapter number 7 here. Um, verse number 3. 2 Kings 7, verse number 3. Um, the Bible says... Uh, verse number three, and there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? That's the title of my message. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor who has a vision to reach uh, the world with the, with the gospel. And thank you for these people who came here this morning. Thank you for many blessings provided for us all this week. Thank you for allowing us to be here, to be with your people, Lord. And Lord, I'm just asking you to meet with us this morning. And if there's anyone who is not saved, Lord, help them to get saved this morning. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you. We can be able to look in the word of God and be encouraged and just move forward with this life here. Lord, we love you. We need you. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And verse number three, at the end of verse number three, the Bible says, why sit we here until we die? And that's the title of my message this morning. Um, um, uh, I would like to start by asking a question. Uh, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Is your goal, what's your goal in life? Is your goal to just to get education? Is your goal is to just have a baby? Is your goal is to get married, maybe? Uh, what's your goal? Is your goal to build a nice house? Or to make a lot of money? I don't know. What's your goal in life? I mean, different people may answer this question in different ways. I don't know, I don't know about you. How would you answer that question about the goal in your life? Um, did God really place you on this earth just to sit and die? Did God brought you here? I mean, you are living right now just to sit and die. Uh, why has God brought you to this church? Sure. Why did he brought you to this church, not another church or somewhere else? So maybe you will never be a Christian, but God uh, saved you and brought you to this church. Right. Why did God do so? Why did God allow you to have salvation? There's so many people who are not saved. Why not you? And you are the one who are saved. Even this morning, you know the gospel. You can, uh, you can tell someone about Jesus Christ, I mean, what he did in your life. Um, let us look on the examples of these four lepers. Um, they finally said one to another in 2 Kings chapter number 7, verse number 3 at the end. They say one to another, why sit we here until we die? Um, I'll jump to my, uh, on my outline here. Point number one, let me say, point number one. No matter what you do in life, you will die. No matter what you do in life, you will die. In 2 Kings chapter number 7, verse number 3 and 4, the Bible says, And there were four, uh, there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, 
And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter in, uh, we'll enter into the city, then the famine is, uh, is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the, uh, uh, the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. Amen. This is the time when the children of Israel, um, uh, there was a famine in the land. And there was a severe famine in the land. And then to the point like uh, people, were, the, the mother, they were eating their babies. It was so bad to that point. And then uh, people were just, they, they didn't have food. And then um, uh, Elisha, he told one of the people, he said, hey, tomorrow you will buy some stuff with the shekel. And then the guy was like insulting the men of God. He said, maybe the Lord in heaven opens up the window and then it's going to be that like what you say. And then Elisha told him, you are not going to see that because you will die. And then there was four people who were, uh, they were lepers. And, and that, at that particular time, leprosy was a very, very bad disease. And they had to be separated. I don't know if it's like about COVID nowadays, you separate people. I don't know. But, you know, the, the time, at that time, they had to be separated. And then because it was so contagious and everything, so these four lepers, they were outside the city, and they were hungry. And then they say, ah, if we go into the city, they're not going to let us in. We're going to die. If we, we sit here, we're going to die. So, you know what? No matter what we do, we're going to end up dying. Yes. We're just going to die. Um, we are in the same position today as those lepers today. You know, I know this, no, uh, it's not an amazing truth, but, you know, uh, uh, many Christians never seem to grasp it. If you do God's will, you will die. If you don't do God's will, you will die. Either way, you will die. Amen. <laughs> Either way, you will die. If you are saved, you will die. If you are not saved, you will die one day. And no matter why, it might be not an amazing truth, but the thing is, like, one day, all of us, we will die. So why not do uh, God's will and serve him with your life? If you know that you're going to die, might as well do God's will. Amen. I mean, serve him. I mean, someday you're going to meet him face to face. You can read 1 John 2, 17 over there. The difference between the man who dies doing God's will and the man who, do, who die, dies doing uh, his own will is the blessing and joy. I mean, there's one who is doing God's will and the other one who's not doing God's will. The difference is blessing and joy. I mean, those who are doing God's will, they will be blessed. God is going to bless them. But those who are not doing God's will, you know what? They're not going to be blessed. They're going to live miserable. Yeah, and the thing is, like, the one who's doing God's will, they're going to have joy. You know, you're helping people, getting saved, and then working for God. And that's why, like the Bible says, why sit we here until we die? Point number two, we must come to the point we are willing to die to do God's will. We must come to the point to, we must come to the point to die doing God's will. You heard about that testimony about 1550, that family, they died, you know, because of they knew the truth and everything. They were willing to die. Right. But on the 21st century, I don't know if the Christians are willing to die for the gospel. I mean, it's easy to say than done, and it's happening quick here in the States. I mean, who is going to stand up for the truth? Who is going to stand up against the government and say, hey, I'm preaching the, I'm preaching the word of God? Sure, amen. I mean, how many, I mean, if the police comes, yeah, yeah, we have seen last year what's happened. Look at California. Yeah. The government is controlling everything. I mean, people are just shutting down the churches, and people are told just to stay at home, not to come to the service and everything. And now it's just going to get worse. Sure this is just the beginning. I mean, how many people are going to stand up and they say, hey, we're going to continue to do God's will no matter what. Because God has commanded us to do his will. You know, uh, in Philippians 1, uh, 21, you can read there. But, but Paul is saying here that either in death or in life, his life is to save Christ. He was saying, I'm going to save Christ even if I die doing it. If I die, I will be going to Christ anyways. That is gain. Amen. Amen. Might as well, if, if you die by doing God's will, that's gain. You'll be going to Christ. And then these lepers, 
They said the same thing in their physical state. They, uh, they did not care if they died. They left compelled to go and they knew that was the right thing to do. They knew these lepers at this particular time, they knew the right thing to do is to do something. I mean, if we sit here, we're going to die. If we go to the city, we're going to die. Might as well die by doing something. Amen. Right. It came to a point uh, where their own lives were not important to them anymore. Say, my life is not important to them anymore. Like, hey, I might as well die doing something. There's an um, illustration here. Uh, there's a missionary, uh, James Calvert was a missionary to the cannibals of the Fiji island. When he and his fellow missionaries landed on the island, the captain of the ship that brought them tried to get them to turn back. The captain said, you will die. The men with you will die. If you stay here, he cried, he told them, let's go back, turn around. And then missionary Calvert replied simply by saying, we died before we came here. We died before we came here. Sure. We died before we came here. You know why? They were looking to do God's will. God has called them to go to the island of Fiji. And it was not a good situation there. People were killing each other. They were eating people and everything. But the thing is like, you know why? They were looking just to go and help those people in Fiji. And then the captain of the ship, he said, hey, you might as well turn back and go back home. You're going to die here. This is bad area. It's a bad neighborhood here. Let's go back home. He said, you know what? We died before we got here. Might as well die by doing God's will. Amen. Amen. And, and, and we know there's so many other missionaries who died uh, doing God's will. Pete Fleming and the other missionaries, they died in Ecuador, if you remember the story. I mean, they died doing God's will. So we must come to the point where we're willing to die doing God's will. Are you willing to die so your life can save others? Are you willing to sacrifice your life so other people can get saved? Are you willing to die so others can get saved? Are you willing to live your life in the way that can be directed to Christ? Others can be directed to Christ. Are you willing to live your life in the point that others can see your life they can be directed to Christ. Or you live your life when they see your life and say, I don't want to be a Christian. Mahatma Gandhi, the leader in India, he said, I would have been a Christian if we were not, so, if we were not for Christians. Because if Christians, they don't get along together, sure. other people, they see us and then they don't want to be a Christian. Do you get along with other Christians? Oh, someone is loving you in the wrong way and you don't get along and everything. Because if you, you as a Christian, you don't get along with the fellow Christians, you know, other people can see that and then they don't want to deal with to be a Christian anymore. Amen. So you live your life on the point that other people when they see your life can be directed to Jesus Christ. Um, there's a story. The story is told of some Scottish soldiers forced by the Japanese captors to labor in the jungle labor road. The men had degenerated the barbarous behavior, but one afternoon something happened. A shovel was missing. A shovel was missing. The officer in charge became enraged. He demanded that shovel, the missing shovel, to be produced, or else everyone is going to die. When nobody in the squadron burged, the officer got his gun and threatened to kill them all on the spot. It was obvious the officer meant what he had said. Then, finally, one man stepped forward. The officer put, his gun, uh, put away his gun, picked up the shovel, and beat the man to death. When it was over, the survivors picked up the blood corpse and carried it with them to the second tool check. This time, no shovel was missing. This time, there was no shovel missing. Indeed, there, was, there had been a miscount at the first checkpoint. Just a miscount on the first checkpoint. The words spelled like a wildfire through, through the whole camp. An innocent man had been willing to die to save the others. 
the incidents had a profound effect. The men began to treat each other like brothers. When the victorious allies swept in, the survivors, human skeletons lined up in front of their captors. And instead of attacking their captors instead, they said, no more hatred, no more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. Someone gave his life to save others. He said, hey, if you're going to kill all of us, someone has to die to save these other people. Because there was a miscount of the shovel missing. And the thing, if, if the man was willing to die for the group, how about you? Why don't you give your life to save God? It's not necessarily you're going to die, but it's going to be a tough one. You know, when you become a Christian and you save God, you know why? You're going to make a lot of enemies sometimes. Because God is on your side and the devil is against you. He's going to bring anyone. He's going to discourage you. He's going to do everything he can to discourage you from serving God. Might as well die by saving God. God may not ask you to die to do his will. God may not ask you to die to do his will. Most like he will ask you to live and do his will and die to yourself. You need to die to yourself first in order to do God's will. Give up your own dreams and, and aspirations. We have a lot of dreams and we have a lot of aspirations. But the thing is like we need to die first on ourselves to give up some of our dreams Amen. in order for God to use us. You know, the thing is like everyone has a dream. And you know, for me, coming from Africa, like so many other people, they want to come to the United States. You know, when you get here, you just want to stay here, get comfortable. Amen. But the thing is, it's a great country. The U.S. is a great country. Amen. Around the world, many, many people are looking forward to come here. Even at the border here, like uh, in Mexico and the U.S. and so many other people coming from different countries. You can see a, a thousands and thousands of people that want to come to the U.S. It's a good country. Even if there's some bad, some other things bad. But in, in, in general, U.S. is a good country. Sure. I came here 2005. I went to Bible college. Graduated, and then I wanted to go back home to start churches there in, in Tanzania. People are looking at me like, you're crazy, man. I just became a U.S. citizen in 2013, and then I could stay here. I could get an um, American dream. Yes, I could have a nice car and nice houses, as long as you work hard. Amen. If you don't work hard, you'll, you'll suffer. Amen. It doesn't matter how good the country is, but you have to, to have an ethic on working. You have to work hard. And the thing, I could stay here and work hard and just uh, continue with my life. And when I get home, people just say, why did you come back? You got to go to the U.S. in America. And everyone's dream is just to get here. What? God never called me to come and stay. God called me to come and got education, got training, go back and serve the people there. The time is very short. Amen. Amen. I mean, I could have the house I wanted. I could have the car I wanted. But the thing is, like, one day I'm going to go six feet under. I'm, I'm going to die. And those doesn't mean anything. I work so hard. Hey, I don't say don't work for the things. But the thing is, like, we, you, you, what's your perspective? Like, what do you see? Do you see a big picture? One day, there's over 350 church members there in Tanzania. If we didn't go, we couldn't have started, and those people will never get saved. Amen. It's like Apostle Paul said, what's my joy? What's the crown of rejoicing in 2 Thessalonians 2.19? He said, what is our joy or our crown of rejoicing? It's Apostle Paul went through a lot of stuff in his life. He never quit to be a Christian, you know, because he said, my joy is to see those people who are supposed to go to hell, but because I stayed and now they're going to heaven. That's my joy and crown of rejoicing. It's up to you. You have to decide to serve God in this life. Amen. You have to decide. Point number three. When he calls you, God will provide. If God calls you, God will provide. Uh, uh, 2 Kings 7, verse number 5 and 6, the Bible say, And they rose up in the, morn, in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Assyrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part, uh, most part of the camp of the Syria, behold, there was, so, uh, there was no man there, 
just imagine these are their enemies. They went to the camp of the enemies. There were so many people there. The thing is, like, um, when these men obeyed God, God's call, God had already worked out the plan, the miracle. Sure. When they obeyed, hey, we're going to go to our enemy's camp, you know, God has already worked the plan, already worked the miracle. Yeah. When God called, he had already run the army off. When he, uh, when he put the, uh, the thought in their hearts, he had already worked away. Think, uh, think about this miracle that God did, God did to them. He had... He had the armies believe that there were a great army coming to help. They did, not, they did not stop and ask the question, how could the Israelites have hired an army when we, had, we have surrounded them? What would they have used to hire them? They never thought. But, you know, God put something in their heart, and God has already prepared a plan for them. I mean, he scared the enemy. Say, hey, there's a big army coming to attack us. And these Assyrians, they ran away. They ran away and they left everything there. When our fathers in heaven calls, God will provide for you. Amen. You know, even Philippians 1, 6, you can read there. Whether his command in the world is specific will for your life, he will provide. A call to pastor or preach, God will provide. A call to be faithful to church, God will. Uh, God will help you, a call to tithe, a call to teach, a call to help others, and a call to be a witness. God will help you through those. Um, when God calls you, he will provide. Uh, we as a missionaries, I, I, we started deputation after we graduated from college in 2009, and uh, it was a tough time. 2008 was a recession in the country. There was no, like, uh, a lot... The country was going through a mess, like no jobs, people are losing jobs. And pastors cannot even bring you in because, like, the economy was not good. But we trusted God. God called us. Amen. Amen. So we stayed into it in 2009. We went through deputation, and we finished up in uh, 2012. But we saw God's hand. God was blessing our Amen. family. God gave us the support we needed to go to Tanzania. In 2013, we went there. So God provided. And if God calls you, don't worry. God will provide. It's not going to be the way you want it, sure. but God will provide. Sometimes we think big, like, yeah, I need this way, but little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. Little is much. Like, even if God provided a little bit, it will go farther than big things. Amen. God will provide. No matter what, just see God will provide in your Amen. life. If God has called you. Uh, just see, know that he will provide. Maybe not the way you want in your timetable, in your schedule time, like, hey, I want now. No, God knows your will. Like, God knows the best for you. He will provide. Point number four, there was no man. Second Kings 7, verse number five, the Bible says, and they rose up in the twilight to go to, unto the camp of the, of the Syrians. And they were, uh, when they were come unto the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. There was no man. Why, why was there no Israelite trying to gather a group to fight in the name of the Lord? Remember, had, had not 300 men with Gideon conquered a thousand? Sure. He conquered a thousand. Why there's no man to go fight against these Syrians? There's no man there. That's a sad statement because, you know, uh, uh, could not God do it again? Because he used uh, David. He went to the camp and then he fought against the enemy. He was defying the armies of God and David stood up and then he was able to win the battle because so he, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to come in the name of the Lord. There's one man gathered everybody and they, they fought and they won. How about this particular time? There was no man to fight against the Syrians. Did God is not alive anymore? If we did before, he's not going to do it again. He's going to do it again. If there's someone who can stand up and say, hey, we're going to go fight for God. Amen. Yes, amen. There, was no, there were no men to go. I have held this phrase other, uh, other times in the Bible. Ezekiel 22, 30, you know, God was looking for a man to stand in the gap. You know, God is looking for a man to stand in the gap. But, yes, there are plenty that will line up. There's plenty of men or people will line up 
to enjoy worldly pleasure. There are so many people who line up to enjoy worldly pleasure. There are so many people who line up meeting up with the girls in the night. There are so many people who line up drinking alcohol. There are so many people who line up doing drugs, cuss, gamble, and still there are so many people. Where are those who will serve the Lord? Where are those who serve the Lord? Where are those who deny themselves? Where are those who resist temptation to serve God? The line to serve the Lord is normally pretty empty. But there's plenty of room in the Lord's line. There's a lot of room in the Lord's line. You just need to surrender your life and say, God, use me wherever you want it. You know, I'll give you an illustration here. George Scott is a one-legged school teacher from Scotland, volunteered for a missions work service in China. When asked, they asked him why he, with one leg, thought of going to China. He said, I, don't see those, I, don't, I do not see those with two legs going, so I must. Thus began his more than 20 years of missions work in China. Sure. The people who are able, with two legs, they don't want to go. The men say, I don't see them going. I must do. I must go. How about you? There's a big group following after the world. Maybe many of them are your worldly friends. Let them go. Be willing to be one of the few. Just let them go. Just be one of the few. You'll be all right. You just be one of the few. We see it again. The need of someone to stand, uh, to stand, but there was no one in Isaiah 41, 28. There was no man among the Israelites. God is looking now for those who are willing to stand, no matter what. We, uh, no matter what. Will you be the man? Even this morning, someone has said, hey, I'm going to be that man. I want to continue to be used by God. I mean, either way, you, you sit here, you eat, you will die. Might as well die by serving God. Sure. I mean, if you're saved, if you're not saved, one day we're going to die. So just think about that. Point number five, I'll, I'll, I'll run, the time is running out. Point number five, uh, the world has no stand. The world has no stand. Second King. Uh, chapter 7, verse number 6 and 7, the Bible says, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of uh, a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of, high, of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore, they arose and fled, uh, uh, they were arose and fled in the twilight and left uh, their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as the, it was, and fled for their lives. The world has no stand, people. The, Lord, the world has no stand. You know, um, uh, uh, these are the people, like, they were scared for anything. They're, they're scared. There's no hope in them. I mean, if you depend on the world, there's no hope in the world. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, when you have seen and oh held of a lion run because he was scared. Let me, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, because where we are in Tanzania, about two hours away, we have a national park. Like there's, uh, there's lions roaming around in the national park. Uh, there's giraffe, zebra, and all these animals. Some of them, you see them on the video tonight. Uh, uh, the lion is not scared of anyone. I mean, he's mighty, and, you know, he can come, and all the, almost all the animals are scared of a lion, you know. And these are Syrians, people that were scared of them. But the thing is, like, these four lepers, when they went in there, they thought these... Uh, the, the Syrians, they thought, oh, man, other, king, the other kings are coming to invade us. They were scared. They ran away. And um, you can read in Proverbs 28, verse number 1. Uh, when, uh, and also in Psalms, uh, chapter 1, verse number 3 and 4. The world is constantly worried. They run when nobody's chasing them. 
Husbands are worried uh, their wives will find out what they're doing. Wives are, wor- are worried their husband will see, uh, will find out what they're doing. Teens are afraid their fathers will hear about how they have been meeting up at night. Thieves are afraid they will get caught. Uh, can artists worried someone will co- recognize them? And they're worried that their own friends will turn them in. They never live in peace. The Bible says that the godly man is not like that. He's not afraid if he gets a hold uh, of other things. Uh, she's not worried about her husband. He's not worried if his wife stopped by his work. The teens will gladly talk about his relationship. She, she should not be embarrassed if her parents heard that what they were doing with their boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, you don't have to be worried because you know why? The world does not stand. But if you're in God, you'll do right. You just have to do right. You don't have to worry. Point number six, um, God will use anybody. God will use anybody. Realize God is using four lepers to bring about his great salvation. Men who could not even come into the city. They were scared. And were hanging outside the gate. They realized when a war were to break out, they were the first, uh, the first one to feel the heat. You know, um, remember when these men, the, where they were, they were outcasts of the society. Nobody wanted them. These men, no one wants them. Like, hey, you can go live outside the city. We don't want you. You have the disease. You have a leprosy. Like, you, you are not going to be used. And it's, it's so many other times, like some of some of us maybe. That we are discouraged because we fell on on the scene, and then you feel like God will never use you. No, God can still use you. If you have a repentive heart, just God will take you back. God has used so many other people in the Bible. Some people were murderers, like David. uh, He was a king. He killed someone's husband, and God still used him. Amen. If you you go in the Bible, you see uh, uh, Abraham or Moses killed somebody, and God still used him. You know, Abraham lied. This is not my wife. And still God used him. Amen. And sometimes you are discouraged, yo, because I fell on sin. The Bible says uh, the just man fell seven times, raises up again. Why don't you raise up? If you fell this week, just raise up and God still wants to use you. As long as you are still breathing, God still wants to use you. It's up to you to choose. Because every day we make a lot of decisions. You made a decision to come here this morning. You could be staying at home. You made a decision to sit on that chair this morning. There are so many decisions you made. You know, you chose to to wear the outfit you are wearing right now. That's another decision. You're going to choose what you're going to eat this afternoon. That's another decision. So it's up to you. You can choose to serve God even this morning. It's up to you. It's up to you. You know, God can use anybody. It doesn't matter your background. Gideon was the, he came from a small tribe of Manasseh. And then he was hiding. And God called the mighty men of, of valor, of war. And then you know what happened? God still used Gideon. He was scared. He was hiding. He came from a very small tribe. It doesn't matter your background. God still wants to use you. I mean, come to Jesus Christ and know the knowledge of God. God can still use anybody. It's not like there's a specific group of people God can use them. No. When you get to heaven, God is going to ask you, the life I gave you, how did you use it? Oh, I didn't go to a Bible college. Did God say you have to go to a Bible college to be used? I don't have a degree in pastoral missions, all this and that. No. God can still use you. It doesn't matter your level of education. It doesn't matter you have to have a PhD to be used by God. God used the layman in the church God can still use you. It doesn't matter. God, if you are willing to be used by God, God can still use you even this morning. Mm-hmm. It's up to you to choose. We chose a lot of things. But the thing is, like, you can choose to be used by God. Though. God will use anybody. God, God wants to use you. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. Um, my mother-in-law, she's 63 years old. She chose to come to Tanzania and work in the mission field with us. doesn't matter how old you are. God can still use you. Amen. Amen. I don't say you have to go serve in the mission field, but the thing is like, we need some to stay and some to go. Amen. You need some to pray for us and some to go. Amen. 
God, God can, can work in your heart to some make and go and some can stay. Amen. Just, I don't want you to misunderstand me. You have to go to the mission field when you're 70 or 63. It doesn't matter. Amen. But you can still be used by God. Amen. Amen. Not necessarily at the mission field. Even here to encourage the young generation also. Amen. We need encouragement from the older folks to us. Hey, boy, you can still be used by God. Right. Hey, we get discouraged sometimes. We are human beings. Amen. We need someone to pray for us. We need someone to keep pushing us and say, we are praying for you. Continue to do. God is going to continue Amen. to use you. Amen. We need that. That's your ministry. Amen. Uh, God can still, God wants to use you. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're good looking or uh, ugly. God can still use you. You know, it doesn't matter you're funny or you're not funny. God can still use you. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your, your skin color. God can still use you. Amen. God uses anyone who is willing to be used by him. Right. Amen. Um, I mean, God, now you see the revivals coming from uh, Mexico and the Philippines and the other countries like they're sending missionaries left and right. And we in America, we have to be careful and yes, like it, we need to know that some, uh, there's a lot of missionaries coming back home than going out. And this country is great because one of the reasons I believe you guys are sending a lot of missionaries. You are there in so many countries sending the gospel, sending the Bible, supporting missionaries. We don't need to stop that. When we stop that, we're going to stop being great. Right. I mean, many people are attracted to come here because of this. It's not other things. This is the key. Even the foundation of this country sure. where people stood up, people died for this. Yeah. And that's why God is honored. Yeah. So we need to start, to start sending a lot of more missionaries. Point number seven, there's always great blessing when we obey God's call. There's always great blessing when we obey God's call. Second King 7, verse number 8, I'm about to finish. Verse number 8, and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, uh, part of the camp they went into one of the tents and did eat and drink and carried there then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. There's a great blessing when you obey God's call. The men ate until they couldn't eat anymore. They were hungry. It was famine in the land. And these guys, they ran away. They left the food, the horses, everything. They left everything behind. And these guys went in. On the first tent, there's plenty of food. They ate until they dropped. They said, you know what? Oh, I couldn't eat anymore. They went to another tent. There's so many food. You know, God blessed them because they obeyed the call. Sure. They, gathered, uh, they gathered the money, the food, and many other things. They enjoyed the blessing of God. They were willing to give their lives and reap their reward. If you're willing to give you a life, God is going to give you a reward. You're going to reap the reward. Those who are willing to give up something will be blessed by God. Amen. In Mark 10, 28 uh, up to 30 there. Um, Our Father in heaven will repay you, you have give, what you have given up hundredfolds in this life, the Bible says. He will repay you. Point number eight. I'm running. I'm just having one more point. Point number eight. Never stop doing the most important thing in life. Never stop doing the most important thing in life. Verse number nine there. The Bible says, then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tear it in the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. I mean, we, we do not well if we don't tell this good news to other people. Never stop doing the most important thing in life. Right. What were they doing that was so long? Is eating wrong to eat? Is it wrong? No. Is getting money wrong? No. It's not wrong. Is enjoying yourself wrong? Is putting money away for a rainy day is wrong? No. Is it, for, uh, is it if you have the greatest news of salvation and you're too busy doing those things and to tell anyone, anyone about it? 
they realized they had great news and they need to tell somebody. Sure. They, we have good news. We have food. Yeah. We have money. We have everything. We have to go tell someone before the sun comes up. They knew there are some other people they need what they have right then. Sure. You know, we need to stop and look at our lives from time to time and ask if we are doing the most important thing. Work is good, but is it taking place for church? Education is good, but is it taking the place for the Bible study? Family is good, but is it pulling you away from the Bible principles you know and believe? Singing in the choir is a good thing, but is it taking a place of witnessing to others? Let us constantly be taking an inventory of our lives and our time sure. and make sure we are spending time doing the important thing in life. Last point, number nine. Let us not keep this great news to ourselves. Let us not keep this great news to ourselves. Verse number nine there, I, uh, I said, verse number nine there. They could not keep this wonderful news of salvation to themselves. Can you? Salvation has come to you, you are silent. <clears throat> salvation has come to you, you are silent. You need to go tell someone else. You need to let people know where you came from, like how God has saved you. That's salvation. It's great news. God has come and saved you. You don't deserve it. By God's grace, you are saved. This is the mercy of God. You know, that's, that's not what we have been commanded to do also. In Matthew 5, 14, 16, there uh, you can read, our job is to shine the light of the gospel. Your job is to shine the light of the gospel. Amen. You know, the thing is, like, it, it's darker today than 50 years ago. Amen. You know, the only thing removes darkness is what? Light. It doesn't matter how beautiful this building can be, how much paint you painted, but if it's dark, it's useless. But if you bring the light, you can see the beauty of it. And the same thing, the world is in darkness there. We need to bring the light. Mm -hmm. You and I, we are responsible to bring the light sure. to the world out there. They're waiting for you. Let your light shine so every man can see. Is your light shining today? It's up to you. Because these men, you know, uh, they, they say, hey, we're not going to keep to ourselves. And so many other Christians, they keep to themselves. Hey, tell other people about Jesus Christ. Tell them about how to get saved. You know, in Romans 10, 10, 13 to 14, you can read there. Will you be like somewhere, I'll say like some other part of the world, they'll never hear the gospel if you don't send them. Right. How can they hear without a preacher? They need someone to go tell them. Amen. Every Christian needs to preach the gospel to every, uh, uh, every Christian needs to preach the gospel to every creature. When we come in contact with the lost, our answer must be, we have to ask them, do you know if you die today, you'll go to heaven? Just making sure, you know, just making sure. They might not, but the thing is like, sometimes you just feel like you lost an opportunity. You could tell somebody and someone passed away. You had a chance. You feel that guilty. So just making sure. Um, these lepers knew how people are starving. It did not matter how much money they got. They had to share the good news. It, that, it didn't matter if people despised them. They had to share good news. We have the greatest job in spreading the good news of the gospel. I'm going to finish with this illustration here. There's a missionary. A missionary in China. Many years ago, a young man went to China as a missionary with an income of 2500 a year. A company decided that they wanted this young man to work for them and offered him a position with $5,000 salary. He declined the offer, and it was raised to $7,000, then to $10,000. But he still declined it. The company asked him if the salary was a sticking point, and he answered this. Oh, the salary is big enough, but the job is not. The salary is big enough, but the job is not. Right. Because he knew that. 
This job here spreading the gospel is a very important job. Right. And one day we're going to put your head in the pillow for the last time. And then you know how many people you witness. You know how many people brought them to Christ. You're going to be happy. But, you know, and then some people, they made tens of millions of dollars. They put their head in the pillow. They regret. Ask Steve Jobs in, the, in his deathbed. Ask him. Like you, some of you read his biography and everything. How about you and I? Hey, we don't make billions of millions of dollars, but the thing is, like, whatever we make, like, let's make sure we spread the gospel. That's very important. We make sure let's support these missionaries. They can stay there. They can preach the, the gospel on our behalf. And whatever they win them to Christ is going to be in our account in heaven someday. What's in your account in heaven? I'm not talking a bank account here. I'm talking about a bank account in heaven. How many souls have been saved because of you? You are the one who makes sure you're going to kneel and pray for that missionary. Some missionaries are going through a tough time. You know, some they are being under attack. Some they are denied their visa to stay in the country. You can pray for them. I mean, you can go visit them and encourage them. You can take it like in Tanzania, it costs you about $1,200. To come there, about $1,500, you'll be able to stay and do some other fun stuff. You know, but the thing is, like, you can be uh, an encouragement to another missionary somewhere. You can give for them to stay. You can pray. You can go. You can do what you can. Because you know why? We need you. We need each other. And it's up to you now sure, to spread that good news. How is your bank account in? Some, they're going to gain a lot. Some, they're going to count loss. But you know why? I travel in this country, almost in 46 or 47 states. Met some great people in the country. People do sacrifice a lot for a missionary to be in the field. Let's not stop sacrificing for these guys, for these missionaries' families to be on the field. Sure. We are not going to... We are not going to go see a big picture right now, but when you get to heaven, you'll say, I wish I could do more. God knows. You know, those souls, those churches, those ministers started in other things. God knows. Just make sure we serve God. Why sit we here until we die? It's my message for today. Pastor.